Okay, we're ready. Welcome, my name is Anita Plummer. I am an assistant professor in the Department of African Studies. We welcome you uh, to this very exciting book talk that we have with one of our own, Dr. Piwakule Mnyandu. I'm gonna begin with a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Mnyandu will provide um, some remarks on his book and then we'll open it up to Q&A. If you have any questions um, during the presentation, you're welcome to type the questions into the chat box, or you can wait until after he's finished and put your uh, questions there. So um, without further ado, we're going to just jump right on in because we're going to have a very exciting discussion tonight. Dr. Mnyandu is a joint lecturer in the Department of African Studies, as well as World Languages and Culture at Howard University in Washington, DC. He also consults international governments on culture and geostrategy. He researches, researches South Africa-China relations, transregionalism, academic diplomacy, and the development and growth of Zulu language. He is interested in the intersection of Isi Zulu and technology, including AI and China's role. He is the creator of Zulunomics app, the first Isi Zulu app by a native speaker. He is the author of 502 Zulu verbs and an Amazon.com bestseller, 251 Zulu verbs. They are the first comprehensive conjunction references of their kind. He is also the author of South Africa-China Relations Between Aspiration and Reality in a New Global Order the first and only book on China-South Africa relations by a single scholar. He is the co-author with Professor Wilfred David of African Humanomics, Economics and the Human Good, and co-edited with Dr. Msia Clark, Pan-African Spaces, Essays and Black Transnationalism. He's from Umlazi, a township of Durban, South Africa, and currently lives in the Washington DC area with his wife, Desiree, his college sweetheart and children's book author from Missouri, together with their three children. So um, Dr. Mnyandu, welcome on behalf of the Department of African Studies. Um, again, we're excited to learn more about your book, South Africa-China Relations Between Aspiration and Reality in a New Global Order. It's now available on Amazon. Um, we also have a coupon code that we can send out perhaps after this talk so folks can purchase the book. If you want to learn more about his uh, other books, please search for him on Howard University's People Profile. All of his books are located there and, of course, Amazon.com. Okay, you can take it from here. You're so nice. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone. I am very happy that um, students and um, our friends, faculty and staff and all our friends could join us in this, what I hope will be an informative, a quick um, talk and an exchange and an exchange. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly and then see where we are. Uh, bear with me. Okay, I um, would like to, first of all, you know, thank uh, always, um, yeah, this wouldn't, such work doesn't happen without the encouragement of students and, and uh, of course, support of family. So I'd like to thank all the students uh, for the probing questions that you often ask faculty, because these questions end up in this stuff. And if you're a student right now and you're kind of, and you, uh, you'd like to write or I'd like you to know that uh, this book took six years to write. Uh, it required a lot of support from families. So I'm grateful to my wife very much so for her intellect. And um, she made a huge contribution to my thinking. So um, I just want to encourage you, if you're a student, to be able to you know, uh, be patient with your uh, thoughts and always find faculty to mentor you. And you're at the best university, Howard University, for such. So this is a true product of Howard University per se. All right. I'm going to uh, give the talk, because of time, I'm going to divide it into two, because the book is divided into two parts. One is a comprehensive history of relations between the Chinese people and the African people. African people is found in South Africa, Southern Africa, in general, South Africa in particular. That's the first part, uh, right there, chapter one. And I'm going to then uh, discuss the second part, which is about contemporary Africa, uh, the relations between China and the temple, uh, contemporary times. This book, uh, of course, it's the first 
um, by one scholar about these very important relations. South Africa um, is China's largest trading partner on the continent. This is a new dynamic because South Africa's relations with China are quite new. So I'm going to kind of do the boring part first because we're being comprehensive. Go over the history, why? Because the history as American scholar, uh, Jonathan Spence says, to understand China today, you must understand China's history. And in this talk then, I will go over this history. Just a side note about the book actually, it's actually right now on Amazon, uh, number, um, it's number eight in the top 10 textbooks about international business. So what does this tell us? It's instructive of, um, of the relations that China is having. Um, it's not, I don't find this flattering, but I find it instructive of the current trends and the importance of Africa and China. If you're a student right now and you're wondering what your major is, uh, whatever you study, if you link it to Africa and Asia in general, China in particular, you will never really be out of work. I can promise you that. So of the 10 books in this top bestseller category on textbooks for international business, guess what? Five are about China. This anecdote is instructive again of the importance to which not just social scientists, but business practitioners put towards understanding this very hitherto enigmatic country, China. And to understand China's today, we must understand its history. And to understand the relations between China and South Africa, I am now going to delve into this history. I argue in this book, um, everyone, that there are two um, uh, uh, relations between the, uh, the relations between South Africa and China, uh, and Africa and China for that matter, may be characterized in two trends. One, uh, there was elusive contact. This is when allusions in Chinese literature in the dynastic era, which I go into, Ming dynasty, Song dynasty. These are, there are allusions made about a people far away in Africa. Before there is going to be any forays into Africa, two words emerge, right? K-U-N-L-U-N, Kunlun. This is a word African-American scholar, Wyatt, um, who wrote a book about this subject. Um, he it comes up with, and he actually does a lot of work in China. And he, this right here, what you are seeing then, it will be a Kunlun, many people, Kunlun, an enslaved human then is going to be traced from the African continent. While this shows the importance of uh, research in this area, there hasn't been that much research on whether the Chinese were going to be involved in the enslaved, in the um, uh, uh, trade in enslaved human beings from Africa. We know that our um, the Arabs are going to make forays into Asia, forays into China, and they will carry with them enslaved Africans from Zinj, which is the place of um, the place of the blacks, as we are going to call it. So these are the early um, uh, contacts between. I call these contacts. Why? Why do I call them contacts? Because the people met. A narrative was formulated, right? So people meet, and when people meet, a narrative is formulated. And this narrative, of course, is going to be subjective. Why? Because it's going to be a Chinese narrative about these people, the Africans. And why is this important for us today? It's important for us today because currently, we'll talk about this later, China is very much involved in what I call a primordial narrative, going back in time, going back in um, dispensation, going back in epoch, whereby China wants to present a certain narrative about its early forays into Africa. And that's the next uh, type of contact then. So we've, um, I've dealt with the elusive contact. Um, so the second word other than Kunlun that comes into view here is this word, is word about the blacks of Africa then. Uh, so the word is going to be Fejo and we'll discuss it in a minute. But at this point then though, China is, uh, China's forays outside are going to be confined into what we call a tributary system, where the Chinese believing in this doctrine that let the barbarians rule the uh, barbarians. This is important. This is important because it's going to give birth to a light touch, laissez faire, all, completely indirect, not even a completely indirect uh, context. In other words, it's going to be 
brief, it's going to be quick, but it's going to be contact nonetheless, and they quickly will retreat. Not before they are able to make some convincing maps about the African continent. These are instructive for two reasons. One, uh, let us look at this map, these two maps right here. Of course, um, this one is by you know, uh, a European, 1554. But earlier, there's this one, right? The, the map of the Ming dynasty and the, and the, the principalities abroad. Notice what, how big the map is and how big China is on, in this map. So we know then this map is quite inaccurate, but given the times, we could afford to kind of uh, forgive the inaccuracy and, for, and not miss the forest for the trees, right? But we, not before we appreciate something, something that China derives its, its very name from, this idea of Zhongguo, Middle Kingdom. In other words, in a benign act of cartography, which you and I may just think, oh, it's map making. It's not. It's the making of the world. When a map is made, a world is made, a narrative is created, one by which that country's children shall learn about themselves and their place in the world. It's no wonder then we will find that this Zhongguo name is going to stick and live on forever. And today it still remains as the name for China, Zhongguo. It is instructive for us to keep in mind, hey, someone may ask, what is the name for Africa? Well, uh, for all its kind of inaccuracies, this map, it does get some things right. Let us look at the shape of Africa in this map. Oh, what do we see? Bodies of water. What do we see? A river. Indeed, what we may see, mountains of the moon, which some have speculated to be the current Drakensberg Mountains. Those of you who have been to South Africa, when you take N3 between Durban and Johannesburg, when you are going one way to, to Johannesburg, on the left, you'll see mountains. Usually it, there's snow capped in, in the winter. Those are the Drakensberg Mountains. They surround the, the country of Lesotho. Well, mountains of the moon. So this map is early, but it's rather dead on as far as some the general shape of Africa. What is the name for the African continent? That is why I did, I included study of this map in, the, in my study of Chinese Africa context. Fejo, the land of nothing. Remember the name. Remember narrative, remember primordial narrative and how what is to us just a benign act may indeed be more than that. In other words, it's not an innocent act, so to speak. And I say this not in a conspiratorial way. It will be, interested, uh, it will be interesting for um, my American, the Americans amongst us to know what the Chinese name is for America. Meigu, beautiful country, right? Yingu, uh, United Kingdom, brave country. So brave country, beautiful country, land of nothing. So if we appreciate this then, that uh, names mean something and the maps mean something, maybe there's food for thought for some of us uh, in contemporary Africa. Why haven't um, Africans made any of their maps? But I digress, right? You get to see though, cartography is very important. Well, Chinese forays into the African continent are going to start being properly uh, uh, manifesting themselves through this is a Muslim, uh, interestingly enough, a Muslim uh, eunuch admiral, Zheng He. Uh, Professor Anira Plama has done a lot of research actually on Zheng He. So I'll be interested uh, to uh, hear a lot of what um, Professor Plama has to say. Uh, well. Uh, I, I, it, 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 journeys are made to, Afri to the African king, um, uh, continent at this time. Contrary to what we have come to know as in scholarship, mainly European narrative, that there are going to be stateless societies in, the, in Africa at this time. They are not. There are going to be city-states, what scholars call city-states, all right? Mogadishu, oh, there's a pop quiz for my students in here, right? What's the capital city of Mogadishu? It's a capital city of Somalia. Barava, Juba, that's in Kenya. Ah, a, a primordial, the roots of a primordial narrative are planted. These roots are going to grow and germinate later into what currently is a very robust Chinese narrative about its presence in Africa, predating even European forests. And this narrative goes uh, something like this. We came, we traded, you had agency, we didn't oppress you, we left. Very powerful narrative. If you want to understand Chinese behavior as a state, 
Chinese formulation of its current foreign policy. You will understand it fully if you understand just how much of a boon or like manner from above, so to speak, this narrative is. Whereas France cannot say that, right? So it's a narrative. But let's look at what, what, the, what this narrative says in earnest, what is said here. Uh, journeying south of Weligama in Ceylon, Sri Lanka for 21 days and night, one can reach this country, which is near Mogadishu. I'm interested in this. Both men and women have hair of knotted fists, Kwan Fu. So my people in, this, in the crowd, if you have Bantu knots, you know that Chinese came, you know, um, in 1300 and found our people with, with Kwan Fu. So this is going to be as accurate of a record as we can find in China about early forays or what we may say the, uh, the closest thing to proof of an African actual fir um, a terra firma uh, presence in Africa, all right? And trading is going to take place. And we've discussed this idea then of city states that exist in Africa at the time. All right, here they are, right? So the presence is going to be here and we are still searching for presence further down, but we need search no more, right? If we were. In South Africa, there is a place called Mapungubwe. Uh, it is gaining renown recently, but in 1930s, this place was unearthed. And what did people find? Well, Sung Dynasty porcelain, uh, everybody. Uh, a Sung Dynasty porcelain, well, we're talking way earlier than 12, 1200, we're talking earlier than Ming Dynasty, right? We're, we're fine. So deep in South Africa, south of Barava, south of Mogadishu, so porcelain, you don't have to be an anthropologist to know if, if you find porcelain, you find life, porcelain, you find thriving, porcelain, you don't find poverty, porcelain, you find trading, and most importantly, as far as China-Africa relations are concerned, and most importantly, as far as uh, this primordial narrative is concerned, you find agency, you find the exchange of gifts, you find trade, you find an African agency in statecraft, you find an African diplomacy. Mm. This then I, I, I identify as part of one aspect of attenuated contact, where contact between the Chinese people and the Africans is going to be attenuated, meaning it's going to be influenced by forces, entities, governance, and so on and so forth that are not of the African and the Chinese making themselves. In other words, there's going to be a lack of agency on the part of Africans. This I, I go into detail in the book and I explain how it manifests in other areas. Please read the book about this Mapungubwe. This, why, here is why, why Mapungubwe is important. South Africa is going to be ruled, is going to fall into apartheid 1948. Before that, the government hides this place. It becomes like Area 51, I think. In other words, it, it, the apartheid government was, it was not inclined at all to show, to display this Mapungubwe place. Why? Well, this place, it's going to show, whereas apartheid was about the debasement of uh, black intellectual capacity, black capability in economy, black capability in statecraft. This kingdom of Mapungu with uh, uh, excavation and finding of Sung Dynasty, it is a direct rebuttal of this narrative. And so it was covered up until quite recently by, by historical, uh, by, you know, um, uh, by other historical accounts. The South Africa is part now of the UNESCO heritage. But here is what why this is important then to study Chinese early history. The Chinese Zhongguo, the Chinese Middle Kingdom, the Chinese are going to retreat. They're going to, a new emperor is going to come and he, this emperor is going to ban seafaring. What happens when seafaring is banned in a country? I asked the Japanese about that time, they'll tell you. Seafaring means there's no longer exchange of ideas between human beings. Seafaring means the technology of violence, which is how countries protect themselves, is not, is not China is not going to enjoy an exchange of ideas on the, the monopoly of violence, innovation, new guns, new cannons, etc. We know what, what follows that. China gets um, it gets um, it gets invaded, and the Chinese look at this time as a very bitter past. I don't dwell into this because I'm studying China-Africa relations. But I was interested in this, what it has to, why this retreat, uh, to explain this retreat 
in the lens of this primordial Chinese narrative and what it has to do with Africa. Well, I call this an equal opportunity Chinese disdain. Why? Well, we may think, well, Chinese are going to retreat because they like, well, well, let the Paparians rule the Paparians. They, in other words, there's an uncomfortable why for me. I call this an uncomfortable why. Well, let's look at what Chinese scholars of the time say about the Africans. If you are sensitive, I am very sorry. This is an, eco, an, an environment of higher learning. This is scholarly work. So please bear with me. Some of these may be quite offensive, but I share with them because one, I'm a scholar. Two, I'm interested in Africans understanding China and Chinese and Chinese forays into Africa the best way they can. So I'm, I would, I'm, it is not gratuitous uh, sharing of these. And so I hope you are not offended by them, but this is what scholarship should be about, right? To kind of find truth wherever it, it, it is. And we are not served by uh, hiding. So they say, well, the Africans, you can read yourself. The land is pestilential, I'm talking about Africa, right? Uh, okay, uh, the people sustain themselves on patient dates. They are unashamed in debauching the wives of their fathers and chiefs. Thus, they are barbarians of the worst, Africans, Fajo, Chinese narrative. But why do I call this an equal opportunity Chinese disdain? Well, the Chinese were not alone in that disdain for the Africans. And this is going to be instructive again, if you're interested in understanding China today, right? To be able to understand that very few favors are forthcoming to the Africans from either the Chinese or perhaps our Arab brothers and sisters or the Europeans. At the same time, uh, right, generally speaking, this is what another an, an Arab scholar says about the Africans. They are brutes with no reason, without intelligence or knowledge. They have no notion of anything. How about a Portuguese? They are exceedingly idolatrous. They have no laws and are the cruelest of men. How about the French? Cosmography de l'Europe. This is like the National Geographic. Remember, there's no Google. <laughs> there's no Wikipedia, right? There's no, there are no, there's no internet. So in other words, if you want to know about Africa in 1544, you would read Cosmography de l'Europe if you were in on France. And this is what you'd read, right? That these people, are they have only one eye and south of the mountains of the moon, this would be my people. There are others who have feet like goats and still others with the face of a dog. How about another view? Does, is it going to be different? Um, well, Leblanc says, so savage, they hardly know how to speak. So dirty, they eat the intestines of animal full of manure without washing them. So then we are back to square one, that there's going to be obfuscations of the record or prejudices, whatever we think of them. But in the book, I then fire, I made the conclusion that this constitutes then an equal opportunity disdain for the Africans that is found not only amongst the Europeans, but the Chinese, but this equal opportunity disdain is going to have vastly different outcomes. The Chinese will disdain and leave. The Europeans will disdain and stay. I always ask the students then, which disdain would you like to have in your life, right? Someone that doesn't like you and stays or someone that doesn't like you and proceeds to, to handhold, to say the least. Okay, so we, I've, I said at the beginning, attenuated contact uh, China, between uh, uh, Chinese and African people. Uh, so we said, well, attenuated by colonialism. Se a second manifestation of this attenuation by colonialism is going to be found in South Africa. This is a picture I found in archives. I like archives. Uh, I do archival work is quite good. You find new things, it's like treasures. And um, uh, the, uh, Jan van Riepik, 1652, all the South Africans in the audience will know this is a word, this is a coded word nowadays on South African Twitter. But Jan van Riepik, one of the colonizers in South Africa, is going to be obsessed with bringing Chinese labor. Why? Because he believes that uh, the Chinese are harder workers than the natives and they are an industrious people. This succeeds uh, about 200 years after uh, he says this, but I, I did a lot of research on it in his journal. Another attenuating uh, factor, apartheid. Most people don't know that actually South Africa and the Chinese people have faced each other in war. This is the apartheid air force during, during the, the, the Korean war. So the apartheid air force was on the side of the United Nations against the Chinese fighting on South Korean soil. Well, let's just say against the North Koreans, but full of Chinese combatants. A lot of sorties were flown. I identified these then include together with apartheid as a forming a long line of events, 
anecdotes that are important in understanding China-Africa relations today. Because to, to understand China-Africa today, we must accept, at least acknowledge the fact that the relations have over time in history been attenuated by these different events. Okay, may I please now make a transition to the current um, period? And this transition is, um, I will start with this. In, um, in 1963, between December and February 1964, a Chinese premier, Zhou Enlai, he makes a visit to African countries. He visits Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Ghana, Mali, Guinea, and Sudan, right? Unheard of, right? He visits the first visit by a high-level Chinese um, uh, official, 1963, and the trip lasts months uh, till 1964. At this time, the China that we know today is not China. The China that we know today is actually the small island in the east of the country called Taiwan. That is the country that is the persona grata. In other words, the country that is recognized in the United Nations and is part is, is, is part of the United Nations Security Council. In other words, in 19, this time, 1963, 1964, if you mention China, you're talking about this island as far as you are concerned in the realm of international affairs. So in other words, quickly then, a factor that's going to attenuate China-African relations is going to be China's PRC, that is communist China, that is, that is the, um, is going to be this idea or this yearning to be a persona grata in the community, in the community of nations, to be recognized as China. Well, 1970s, resolution 2758 uh, passes over 70 nations vote. Yes, of those 35 are Africans. This seals this narrative again, that the Africans, uh, it was to China's incremental advantage for African countries to gain independence so that the numbers will increase at the United Nations and a favor will be forthcoming. Why is this important in understanding things today? You understand that China, a capable state, China, a calculating state, China, a state that is driven wholeheartedly by national interest is quite shrewd in being able to act in its interest, right? So in understanding China today with any Chinese relations with an African country, you must understand this almost as a frame of reference. But at this point, I mentioned this here, that an, an, a scholar from Africa, a young man at that time was studying in London, they were asked, what do you think about China? And that's what the young man said. He said, we have no more to learn from, we have more to learn from our past masters, especially industrially. For this field, uh, for in this field, China has very little to offer. The, I like this because um, it teaches me as a scholar to be quite careful when I make predictions and when I study. This scholar is still alive, actually. So he, he was talking about this current China of today that is kind of a behemoth and a, a power. So you are able to see then that in Africa, there was this reticence about China. Okay, times have changed since then. All right. Look in 1998, the, the trade between uh, South Africa and China, 1.8% of South Africa's trade was with China. Okay. But in 2019, 14.5, right? How about trade with other, so what we may call traditional partners? Look at the United Kingdom, big, about 10%, about 11. How about in 2019? Okay, seven. So yeah, look, this I characterize as the changing dynamics of China-Africa relations. Why are these important, important to consider? Because I looked at the data of, uh, so that to engage with the narrative. The current narrative usually is that China, ex Africa exports, right? Exports uh, finished goods to China, China buys, China adds value to these goods and China even sells them back to Africa. I said, okay, yes. So let me look at what the data says. So what did I do? I looked at what we call the trade matrix. The trade matrix, it takes, a, it's basically a basket of goods and each good is coded. It's a United Nations standard coding. And basically it's a basket of goods and these goods are categorized. This is a universal categorization. I took the top eight products that are exported by South, from, by South Africa to China and the top eight products that are exported by Africa to China. And I took the top eight products that are exported, in other words, an average that are exported by the world to China, okay? And then I did the same with import, the top eight products that are imported from China by South Africa with about Africa and what, and I coded them. In other words, I coded the ones that, um, for example, the ones that are imported by both South Africa and Africa and the world 
I coded them one way. The ones that are imported both by South Africa and Africa, I coded them another. The ones that are imported by the world, et cetera, you get the point at this point, uh, this time, right? And then I've made my findings, but already I don't think I need to discuss the findings for you to be able to see already that there's a huge commonality going on here. So to do us all a favor, I'm going to jump to the data and the findings. What does the data say? What does the data tell us about exports? Well, let's look. Among the top imports of only one country or territory from China, imports, in other words, there's going to be about two imports that are only exclusive to one country. Among the top imports or exports of South Africa, Africa and the world into China, huh, six. In other words, these found commonality and occurrence across these three jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the findings then about exports? Well, in the interest of time, I'll jump right into them. All right, first, according to the data then, between the top eight exported products from South Africa, Africa and the world totaling 24, South Africa had only one product category in common with Africa, okay? Oh, interesting. Africa also had four product categories exclusive to itself. So South Africa was less similar to Africa in its export patterns to China. Africa was more homogenous, okay? This may suggest that a majority of South Africa's top exports to China, although shown to be highly concentrated in the concentration index, the specific products exported upon closer analysis of their classification were vastly different from Africa. Interesting. Two, four product categories were exclusive to South Africa itself. This is instructive. In other words, for a, out of eight, four products were just South Africa by itself. South Africa only shared two top export categories with both Africa and the world. How about um, another one? South Africa shared only one top category export with the world. Summary, South Africa is unique in its exportation of goods to China. South Africa bucks the current, the trend then of the narrative. What does that mean about us in talking about China and South Africa, China and Africa, China and South Africa? We must have vastly different conversations when we're talking about China, Africa, we must now disabuse ourselves from this nebulous discussion of Africa and China, or China and Africa. But there's China and South Africa, China and Zimbabwe, China, et cetera, et cetera. This is the scholarship. And I'm glad that uh, Dr. Anira Plummer is here, who actually deals with a lot with uh, East African countries, which is a, 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 a nuance I'm talking about. How about imports? Okay, how about imports? Well, South Africa only shared two top import categories exclusively with the world. Interesting. These were uh, mis miscellaneous manufactured articles and you see there. This may signify a convergence of South Africa's imports and consumption patterns with those of the world. In other words, what is mostly imported by the world has tended to be mostly imported by South Africa as well. In other words, there is no Africa that is import South Africa, sorry, that is importing finished goods from China. Just there is a world that imports finished goods from China. All of us sitting here from head to toe, uh, if we're wearing five articles of clothing, three are from China. Doesn't matter whether we're from Jamaica, we bought them there, or Seattle, we bought them there or you know, Tanzania would bought them there. In other words, then narrative, the current narrative about China needs more qualification based on data. And that is what I attempted to do here. How about number two? Well, secondly is that um, of the eight top categories of imports, South Africa shared six with both Africa and the world. Okay, I'll stop there, right? Out of eight, South Africa shared six. So in other words, if, uh, so everyone is importing stuff from China. Now we may talk now about quality, who's importing who. So it, my, the point of this, um, of looking at the trade matrix was two. One, to be able to qualify the narrative and be able to have us to move the scholarship on China, Africa ahead. So that it is no longer a binary of China import, China exporting finished goods from Africa. It does that with Nicaragua and Canada, right? And then the other one of, well, I wanted also to be able to add more knowledge and data 
data-driven um, uh, qualification of this narrative. In, in, so we may not, um, instead of complaining about it a lot. So uh, this shows a departure. So um, I will stop here and ask how many minutes I have so that I respect your time. Can you wrap it up in five minutes? Awesome, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, we've discussed this data. Well, why don't I go maybe deeper in the third one? The convergence of imports and consumption patterns is also demonstrated by the data in world South Africa, as well as Africa together. Products in the categories classified as telecommunication equipment, footwear, electrical machinery are the top exports found among all three importing markets, right? Sneakers, we all import sneakers from China. Narrative, narrative qualification, try data driven, the future of China African study. Well, the future that is now. So why, why did I do this as well? This is another chapter that deals with EWU. The students among us here, if you like to make money, um, uh, you just put in 5,000 together with friends, go, go to EWU and buy some things with economies of scale and come back and sell them on Etsy. You make quite a few bucks for yourself, trust me on this one, right? If I like money more than scholarship, I would have stayed in China during the research and just do that, okay? And also be on billboards. Again, they like um, over there, if you are, if you are brown, you kind of make it into many billboards. We usually see the negative stories, but there are quite a lot of success stories in EU. Why am I sharing this anecdote? Because EU is not Guangdong. It's in, in the middle of Zhejiang province. It's instructive for current Chinese policy as well. Who used to be the, um, uh, the chairman of, in other words, the governor of EU, what we call governors. Over there, they call them the chairman of the party. Oh, they call them, I think, governor as well in, in the parallel system, Xi Jinping. So the current president of China was actually the governor of Zhejiang, which is the province that does the most business with Africa. So to understand China's forays and its very robust uh, forays into Africa, you must understand the personal um, hand and touch that with our personal attention with which Xi Jinping has dedicated to nourishing this relationship because as governor of the province of the 36 provinces, depending on who you are, 36 or 35, he is very aware of China's, uh, of Africa's importance. So to end then, I'm going to come here to my um, favorite slide. One of the contributions then that I sought to make is to make what I call a, the quadrilinear model of Africa-China analysis. So in other words, then when we're talking about China, Africa, we will not understand if we do not compartmentalize. So when you're talking about China and relations with South Africa, it, they take place in three domains. One, the red one, this is the bilateral one, Chinese, South African government and Chinese government, bilateral relations. The second domain is the blue one, South African nationals and Chinese nationals. These we call people to people uh, uh, relations. And then there is this middle ground, that's why it's purple. I had to ask my wife, I, I, I had apartheid education. I really didn't know, um, what, what color is produced by red and blue. I really didn't. I had to ask my wife and she told me it's purple. So to make this analysis, so I, uh, kudos to my wife, I give her credit. I had no idea. That's what apartheid did, seriously. Uh, so this, uh, this purple, this purple, right? Um, uh, 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 this we, I call misolateral, misolateral level. The relations between the South African government and Chinese national and the South African nationals in China and the Chinese government. So if a, a Chinese national is involved in drug dealing in South Africa and they get caught, and we're having a discussion and the narrative forms, often this narrative then, if it's not a sophisticated discussion we're having, will tend to, will tend to spill over to what we think about the bilateral relations. Meanwhile, we must be able now to separate these domains so that we may better analyze these relations. Because for example, um, if, um, if you were not talking about a Chinese national, you're talking about maybe an American or a French, you don't think, oh no, the relations between South Africa and France are in peril because a French national was found doing this you know, in Guinea. No, 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 no. These are bilateral relations and these are the misolateral relations. We must be able then in African studies to separate and nuance them thus. And I thank you for your attention. I'll stop here and engage in a question and answer. What I've done, I've discussed the first part, which is historical, the second part, which is co uh, uh, contemporary. 
I said Chinese relations have been characterized, been characterized in two ways. They've been elusive, where there was such allusion to Africans, and there was an equal opportunity disdain that, and I went through how this equal opportunity disdain manifested itself. And I said they were attenuated, attenuated by colonialism, apartheid, and independence and, li and, and liberation as well. Then I moved to the trade matrix, how it kind of bucks what we've come to know. And then I, I concluded by actually say, um, kind of coming up with a solution. One way is to identify the different domains in which relations between the Chinese, Chinese anything, and Africans, Africans anything, in this case, South Africans, take place. I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Myandu. Yeah. That was such a, a richly textured and nuanced presentation. And I mean, just to provide some context, because you mentioned it, but I just kind of wanted to marinate <laughs> in terms of the participants here, that less than five books have been authored that solely look at an African country oh, wow. and China. And wow. of that, I think you're the second person from who's African who's written uh, a book on this topic. No so way. I've never thought of it in no way. Yeah, we have to look at voice, right? Because I think voice matters and perspective matters. So the issues that you're bringing out, the, the nuances, it, your perspective, I think is valued. And hopefully, you know, it, your book will serve as a model for future studies that looks at all, you know, the historical, the political and the economic dynamics. So um, I open, um, I ask the audience to please post your questions in the chat. Um, I am going to <laughs> start off. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> it's okay, folks. Um, again, thank you so much. Like my, the wheels in my mind are turning. <laughs> because you've you. so many you know, interesting dynamic um, issues. Right. Um, almost to the point where I think you have, let me look, how many chapters do you have in this book? I'm like, we need an hour session. I know. <laughs> seven hours. No, nine hours, actually, <laughs> with the introduction, okay? But like nine have, chapters, nine yeah, chapters, yes. We need an hour per chapter minimum. That's so, true. <laughs> um, the quadrilineal matrix that you propose, I want to dive deeper into the dynamics between the South African government and Chinese nationals. I want to know if any issues with regards to immigration have come up? Because you've mentioned in the book, you talk about the trade centers um, in which you know they're cropping up mostly in, in Southern Africa, but we've seen a trend. And maybe you can describe to the audience what these trade centers are and what they look like um, for folks who've never seen it. Um, if you could please just talk about if there've been any issues or tensions with immigration policy, one, Two with the trade centers, mm. you, you looked, you you explained what's being um, imported in, you know, sneakers, telecommunications equipment. Mm. What does that mean for South African entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know in terms of the Chinese nationals and South African nationals, those dynamics. Yeah, um, yeah so I'll just start there and we'll see where the conversation goes. Please put your questions in the chat. <laughs> This is awesome. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Plama. Uh, awesome question. Uh, well, let me first look at the data I uh, looked at. So if I go here, if you pardon me, everyone, um, this is the chapter I looked at. Uh, China's economic growth and South Africa's unemployment. In other words, this is quite a, a, this was, I had to be brave when looking at this. I had to think outside the box. I looked at Chinese migration patterns into South Africa, what Dr. Plama is asking, uh, what you're asking Dr. Plama. And I wanted to find out um, if there are any effects on South Africa's own developmental imperatives, right? And if they are, what are they? Well, let me discuss the data off the top of my head. Sorry, it's not in front of me. Read the book if you'd like a, um, a more comprehensive view. I took um, the... I looked at the uh, permanent residence uh, permits that were granted in South Africa in a space of four years, right? I took the top five um, uh, countries whose citizens were granted these permanent residences the most. I did the same for temporary residence permits. And I looked as well at the reason, the reason that 
these countries were granted. In other words, when you come into South Africa and say, I would like a, 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 a version of a green card, you say, I am here to work. I am here to tour. I am here to study. I am here to visit um, another one, another category. Well, uh, Chinese, because they are top, the Chinese, the Nigerians, the Zimbabweans, and the Bangladeshis. Uh, of course, as we will imagine, the other three Africans, some of us who know about immigrate migration into South Africa, will know that these were the top Nigerians, Zimbabweans, and um, uh, yeah, Nigerians, Zimbabweans, and Bangladeshis, of course, uh, Asian. But then China was right there. And the biggest reason for amongst the Chinese was for work. So in other words, the biggest reason that a Chinese person wanted a permanent residency into South Africa was not as a tourist, not as an investor, but for work. And there are categories. And what age, I looked at the age of these, um, also these top immigration, um, uh, the, the top cohort, as I call them, the top cohort of immigrants into South Africa, because once I found out that China was among the immigrants, I studied China with its, uh, with its cohort. Well, they were the, the Chinese were the youngest of them, uh, ranging from 28 to 34. Why is this important? I thought from kind of a, 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 a scholar, ask, from a perspective of asking questions, not of finding answers yet, but of asking questions. Well, guess what? If unemployment has a face in South Africa, it is black. If it has a gender, it is uh, female, women. And if it has, a, uh, if it has a, a, an age, it is young. The most unemployed, 80% of the unemployed are going to be people exactly in this age group. So this piqued my interest. Is there an effect on this immigration of the, of, for reasons of work? Oh, and then um, the, I looked at when these people ask for permanent residences from China, do they, what are the reasons or how do they gain, gain it? Do they gain it through government or their company or family? They gain it through family. So in other words, someone comes from China, to open up a trade mark market and they call three of their cousins and they join them. And these people will be employed in this industry of trade. So I made some conclusions in the chapter about this, but hopefully I've piqued your interest in that I looked into this and yes, they are young. Yes, they come into work. Yes, they are not unemployed at all. And yes, they are into commodities trade. Here is where this, um, um, uh, I made a conclusion then for South Africans. With it, the jobs that they do are not miracle jobs, right? The South Africans often think Chinese are geniuses, you know, they come in with these products and they sell them. Well, according to my research, this is not uh, so. The people simply went to EWU and bought using economies of scale. In other words, bought a lot for less wholesaling. They're in charge of the supply chain. And so they're able to reap economies of scale from China to South Africa and simply distribute. If South African government wanted solutions to this, it could actually then go to the most unemployed, the young women who are black and subsidize them to go themselves to China. In other words, replace the Chinese who are acting as middle people unnecessarily so, like other African countries have actually sought to do, including Uganda, right? So that's one aspect of it. So I'll be able to I'll be able to discuss more, but um, that's one. Thank you. So we've seen the trends. I've, I've, in Kenya, the Kenyan government <laughs> actually put in stricter immigration laws. Yeah. Of course, you know, investigators uh, found out. Journalists later found out that the Kenyan government, even though they restricted immigration laws to prevent. Yeah. You know, of course, they said Asian immigrants, you know, young people were protesting and said there are too many yeah. Asian immigrants taking our jobs. They changed the immigration policy only to find out that they were still issuing visas to Chinese workers. Um, so um, very interesting. So we have a few questions from the chat. Um, so Dr. Johnson asked if you could explain um, why South African exports to China are so unique as opposed to other African countries? And then how does that trade relation impact China-South Africa re relations writ large? Oh, awesome. Do you oh, want to wow. group or one at a time? Awesome. So let's ask that one. Let me, uh, let me go deal with that one and then I'll come back. Of Sounds course, good. Professor Johnson asks this difficult question, which I'll never satisf uh, ask, answer satisfactorily because she's my, she, she knows more on these things. And she's been doing more uh, work on this as I have. 
So uh, uh, awesome question. So let's look, why are they unique? Well, South Africa um, is kind of has a unique capacity, industrial capacity, right? And this capacity was gained through the years, through what we call the industrial security complex or the South Africa's industrial complex, where South Africa had what I call a garrison economic and industrial policy. It needed to survive. And it, in, in order to survive, it became quite self-sufficient because many people were fighting against apartheid. It was sanctioned. So it learned to survive by making so much and being able to invest in security sector, which poured more money into its industry, especially mining. So all the industries, anything really, they had what we might call a, a host pipe approach. Whatever worked in order to help the, the apartheid government survive, they poured money into it, whether it's livestock or not, and so on and so forth. So then this basically helped South Africa to actually post-apartheid South Africa to have an uncanny capacity on things in a unique way. Remember, what are some of these unique things? Pulp and waste paper. Look at that. Pulp and waste paper, yeah, it exactly means that. Recycle, recycle paper, it gets mushed, uh, it gets put into basically blocks and gets shipped over to China. Lord knows what they do with it, but South Africa has capacity on these. Instructive here, vegetables and fruits, huge capacity. Many of you, if you go to the to aisle four at, um, at um, a Safeway, there's a juice called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. Boom, it's from South Africa, right? So South Africa has gained this capacity um, in, in its industry and has been able to actually leverage it post in post-apartheid era. And China was happy to just join and pick up the slack that was left by what I call a denaissance. In other words, instead of a renaissance with a denaissance, um, the, the, the boom and takeoff of it didn't happen in Africa in 2000, much to the consternation of leaders like Tabombek and disappointment. And so uh, as European investment, FDI, foreign direct investment pulled out, China was able to pick up some slack and encourage actually growth in these industries, right? None, uh, uh, let's look at this, textile fibers and their waste. You know, like some, I think some of these are as, can be as simple as, um, like sheep, right, or some animal skin sometimes, and what comes from the fibers that come from the animals, if it's put together into a fiber and makes this, and it gets lumped together, it goes over there. So again, this requires a bit of machine, machinization, which is only going to be found, I suppose, uniquely in South Africa, at least uh, comparatively, as compared to the region. And South Africa is able to take advantage of this. I suppose then, a, 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 a way forward maybe for South Africa, if we had policymakers here that are doing that job, would be to actually stop it and actually complete the process of value addition. But this requires extra capacity that may perhaps be beyond South Africa's reach for now. But that's the best I can do there. And then what's the second part of Dr. Johnson? Please, uh, may she not have a follow up. <laughs> oh, how does the trade relationship impact just South Africa, China relations in general? Oh, yes. Um, this is, um, yes, good. I will answer this by, uh, and simple and its implications for, um, for South Africa's, for, for transformation. Those who don't know who are non-South Africans, transformation is this idea that South Africa's apartheid economy disadvantaged black people who make 80% of the country. So there's an imperative in South Africa there's growth imperative and there's a transformation imperative. In other words, if it's anything that's viable or is found, any policy in South Africa that, is found, that finds viability in the ruling party or in government, in government circles or what we might call in, among the practitioners must have an imperative to transform. Sometimes the imperative to transform does not gel well with the imperative to grow, right? In other words, transformation may lead actually sometimes to some of these industries not being staffed well and so on and so forth which is a people debate it, but that's what happens. So how uh, is uh, South Africa um, trade affected? How is the, uh, South Africa's trade affected? Um, South Africa and China uh, relations affected trade? Well, they're booming. What, what happened actually is that old companies that were state companies, they privatized in South Africa post-apartheid. And what else happened? These companies, they've actually gotten capital, investment capital. So Chinese equity has poured into South Africa. So I actually, uh, how, do I, uh, how do we know this? There's an anecdote that a few years ago, the former president fired one minister 
Miss, uh, Mr. Pravin Kodan, uh, or I think, yeah, he fired one minister and chose one minister. Well, within a couple of days, this minister had been fired. Why? Because the rent fell, there were ramifications and they were quick. One of the ramifications, as uh, so goes, this, this story may be apocryphal, is that the president got a, a phone call from China, right? The president got a phone call from China, one of the large, which holds a large stake in very large bank in South Africa. In other words, China is ensconced in South Africa's economy. And this has ramifications for its growth. But as I started when I answered the question, it also has ramifications for transformation. Because once a company is doing business with China and South Africa has comp comprehensive strategic relations, meaning really South Africa can't be messing with any trade. Well, what if the company is not fully transformed? Well, it's doing business with China. We have comprehensive strategic relations, so you can't mess with it. So this gets complicated. Transformation imperatives, they sometimes clash with growth imperatives. And China is not in the decision-making in this. It just cares that its investments are not jeopardized. Okay, great. So um, we have another question here, um, and I'm gonna lump it with the question I have, okay. So um, one of the question is, questions is, why do you think South Africa is allowing China to build their own police stations in South Africa? How does this impact South African citizens? Have you heard this before? What an excellent question, okay. <laughs> right? Someone has traveled, someone has been to South Africa. What an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is um, why we do these talks, right? Someone knows. L why do you think South Africans are letting? Excellent question. Why? Because it takes away the agency from the Chinese. Right there, this question is already in a higher level of analysis because the Chinese, Chinese state is quite, those of you who've been to China, uh, you know when you go to China, you sign on the visa before you leave America, wherever you're coming from. I shall respect Chinese law. Two, I shall respect Chinese culture. In other words, you can not lean on a statue that's important, whatever. So in other words, and when you get to China, you must register. I had to register at your nearest police station. And in other words, then there is this abiding sense that, look, I'm not at home and this state can actually implement its laws and they're robust and you can implement them. So you, it kind of calibrates your actions, right? Well, South Africa suffered a lot from crime in the last 15 years. We know that. South Africa, like I visited my old neighborhood where I grew up. It was a nice middle-class neighborhood in Umlazi, but the houses, they, some houses which never used to have gates, they were now had gates, it was quite depressing, right? Uh, they now had gates, the gates were long, the fences were long. My wife was an American from Missouri. Usually first thing she, she complains about in South Africa are the tall walls and the electric fence. Like what's up with that? So it goes without saying South Africa's crime rate and the government ineptitude when it comes to dealing with it has gone down. So right there, we have zero in on one thing compared to the Chinese state. There is a great deal of state incompetence in South Africa, right? So the government people don't like hearing this. They say you are judging us, but I'm saying this in comparison to the Chinese. So in other words, then at the failure to secure Chinese traders, at the failure to secure, it only takes a couple, like five Chinese traders to get robbed and hijacked. And then China is like, well, come on, right? So the China acted and said, well, you will come up with a solution for you. Why don't we have auxiliary police? They will not be armed, maybe they will, and they'll stay in, chi in Chinese uh, uh, parts to secure the Chinese, to do what you are failing to do. And also, remember they speak Chinese, so you don't speak Chinese, your people don't speak Chinese, and this will help us out. Now, if South Africa was a stronger state and kind of, it would have resisted this. Ah, but it's a very, very, very different setup in South Africa. So it defeats me, but it, I, I've, but I've, at least I've been able to explain to you the genesis of it from the Chinese perspective, that the Chinese said, enough of this, enough of our people getting robbed. And when they go to the police station, they're told to come tomorrow, right? So let us secure. And Lord knows why, but the South Africans said, sure, or else we'll pull some things out. So there were disincentives that were presented by the Chinese. But my point then, because I'm always going towards challenging African agency and African accountability, is that the South Africans caused it by letting crime run amok and unchecked, especially against investors. 
Wow. So a question of sovereignty then comes into play. Anytime you have private foreign police forces that are securitizing certain geographic areas, yes. then you're giving up sovereignty. You brought up agency and African agency is a very important thread in your book. Will you please talk about, you know, how you conceptualize South African agency and whether or not the South African state has been able to provide, whether it's for their people or for narrow elites. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Plama. I think in, um, uh, in, in chapter seven of my book, I deal with this, uh, this idea of the developmental state that since Nelson Mandela, the South African, Nelson Mandela said, it's inconceivable that there will not be a developmental state in South Africa. So the South Africans like mouthing about this. Developmental state, developmental state, would like to build a developmental state. What's a developmental state? Well, the father of the developmental state, Chalmers Johnson, said there are four elements. One of them is a, a, a talented bureaucracy and what he calls bureaucratic latitude. In other words, once the, in other words, meritocracy, right? You can't do cadre deployment, right? You can't say this comrade has this car, and so they will just imagine that they have the skill, right? They must have the skill, uh, a talented bureaucracy. And once you put this capable uh, bureau bureaucrat, there must be latitude. In other words, they must have agency and a wide berth of agency in order to implement certain of these developmental imperatives. Well, of course, um, for reasons that most of us know, South Africa has been kind of, a success has not been forthcoming given South Africa's capacity in all this, this idea of agency. Well, and then you mentioned earlier on sovereignty, right? Sovereignty. I think um, uh, one thing, one way of answering that also, the rationale was that South Africa's relations are now at, because China, there are three relations that China classifies its relations with, uh, so it, it classifies um, uh, its relations with uh, any specific country. There's a partnership, lowest, there is a, a, a strategic partnership and a comprehensive strategic partnership. So South Africa has comprehensive strategic partnership with China. So in other words, they not only, at least uh, we could ask, uh, that's the given of it, they not only uh, cooperate just on development, but they cooperate on security as well. See, so some of these things then are able to be put, it's an envelope that you slide under the door if you are a capable state and China has years, I'm sorry, centuries experience in statecraft. So it's able to do some of these things. And one of my uh, critiques in the book is that South Africa is not able, according to my, my, uh, this is my opinion, to match chi Chinese statecraft in very fundamental conceptions of the, in very fundamental parts of these relations with China. It's not. Are there any other questions? So um, if, you, if you'll just indulge me, I know you've um, written also on education diplomacy. Yes. Uh, extensively. Will you talk about the status of education diplomacy between China and South Africa now within the context of COVID-19? I know that's a lot. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot. And, this is know, a, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a difficult one because um, China was kind of, as some of you know, this zero policy and kind of it locked down things. And many South Africans actually lingered for weeks uh, in China and they were not able to leave. But this was not uh, unique. This was not unique only for South Africans. So many students that were in China uh, actually got locked out and they couldn't move. So, well, uh, many came back to South Africa, but many of them have not gone back. Well, some of them, perhaps did not want to go back. So I think uh, for me, I haven't done any work on this, but I think some of you who are sitting here who are scholars, it may actually be a nice uh, point for you to research this, uh, the, the effect of COVID on China-Africa relations, right? Because there is the public diplomacy, what we call COVID diplomacy, right? And uh, Dr. Plummer, this, you know, the masks and all these things. But then there's this other academic diplomacy where, African students who are in China, thanks to deals between the Chinese government and any one African country's government to have its students there. Well, what is the, 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 the effect of these policies on these students' lives? And it's something I haven't looked into. And I, I think I, 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 I actually would like to look into now that you say. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think you're <laughs> you're just thank, you. thank you for that. Let me write that down. <laughs> yes. Um, so unless there are any questions from the floor, um, I I have one more question. Oh, okay. Okay, so there's a question about, and I'm not quite clear what the question is. It says, How are Africans treated with respect in the business world? Um oh. This is a very nice question. Okay. In China. In China. I'm going to, yeah, I'm okay. going to. And this is very good. Those of you who've been to China, you know that um, there is always a talk. Oh, Chinese are racist. Chinese are this. You know, China. Well, okay. China is a very homogenous country like Japan, right? So let's just qualify this, right? So when you are in China, you know you're a foreign. Okay, great. So when you're in China, then like you'd be in, so you kind of stick out. But um, the Chinese have a, I found, they have a parallel system in how they treat uh, uh, Lawai, which is Lawai foreigner. There's kind of the Lawai, the foreign guest, what I call the foreign guest, and the foreign devil type treatment. The foreign guest treatment, and these are terms that have been used that are still used in Chinese, uh, by the way, in the Chinese, um, uh, in the Chinese uh, just uh, vocab, actually. Uh, Lawai, foreign, uh, foreign guest and foreign devil. So if you are a scholar like myself, you're educated, you're hanging around in universities, you actually in China have quite a comfortable life. So in other words, although you may be black or brown, you actually get left alone. You actually get away with stuff. You jaywalk and you don't get stopped because they're like, hold on, we kind of right now we're busy with Africa and we want to show, we don't want bad PR. This person looks like an important person. So it would be bad guangxi to be able to treat to mistreat this person. So you actually will may, may not find these rash instances of kind of racism, right? And then let's move to the other side. But if you are maybe a, a Nigerian, a South African, a, 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 so, a Somali student, or used to be a student, but now you've absconded your visa, if I may use that, you're now trading, but you don't have papers. In other words, you are a social nuisance in not my perspective, in the perspective of the people you will get a vastly different treatment, right? So there is a parallel system of how Chinese people treat you in business. So when I was in Iwu then, as a school, Iwu is a town that is full of Africans, middle of Norway, Zhejiang province, where you travel for like, for like four hours without seeing a foreigner and then boom, in the middle of Norway, Africans everywhere. There is even a mosque for Sudanese and North African brothers and sisters to, um, to pray. There is a, a exotic street there. So those of you who are interested in storytelling about Africans in the world, that's a nice thing to make a story on. Iwu, Y-I-W-U. And where, wherever you walk, you're treated so well. Like you, I guess, so these people, there's an understanding, I talk about this in my book, that these people 20, uh, 35 years ago were rice farmers, peasants. You can still see their skin is vastly darker than the other Chinese because they spend so much time in the sun when they're older than the age of 55, right? So they recognize collectively that, but for these Lao Wai, these strangers from afar, their lives would be vastly different. They wouldn't be driving the Range Rover that they now drive, right? That is parked outside the store. And their, fo and their fortunes changed because the Chinese government came and instituted what they call one village, one product. They came and said, Hey, Piwo, in this village, you now produce nothing except you sew ties. In this village, you now produce nothing except you sew, you, do you produce toilets, like toilet seats. So all of you, your toilet seats come from one place in Zhejiang province, which is called Toilet Village. I'm serious. Your ties, unless they're special, 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 they come from one place that the Chinese government decided to either to, at some point, make a Thai place, et cetera, et cetera. There's even a village for... Uh, making artificial artworks from around the world, like Michelangelo, boom, it's made right there. So in other words, then, if you're African or whatever your color is, you will really not see any discrimination as a business. There's just an actual exchange of money. So because there's this idea that you are important, the government is fully behind this, and Xi Jinping is personally behind this in Georgia. And so you shouldn't mess with these people. But this is vastly different in the space, in this space of kind of legal, where your legality is questioned or is under is under kind of uh, suspicion, right? And so I saw a lot of this. Uh, I saw a lot of this. Great. So um, the title of the book is South Africa China Relations Between Aspiration and Reality in a New Global Order. 
Final question. <laughs> South Africa is really, in terms of the new global order within the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa group, um, you've mentioned G8 in your book. How does this relationship with China impact South Africa's position globally? I know you don't predict the future, but <laughs> if we were to say snapshot right now and perhaps- well, How does um, the relationship between who? And China. South Africa and China. Because so, you mentioned in the book that China helped usher South Africa into the process. Awesome. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, yeah, I deal with this idea then um, that South Africa in, um, uh, in 2000, 2004, 2008, Thabo Mbeki, the former president of South Africa, everyone, uh, two, two presidents ago. Uh, would actually give a speech in 2007 or six that he said he actually um, it went something to the effect that we don't want a second colonizer. Whoa! Everyone was like, "Whoa!" Thabo Mbeki said what? And sure enough, while well, at the time Thabo Mbeki was nursing these big ambitions of an African peer review mechanism or this growth model, African solutions to African problems. Unfortunately, there was none of this to effect, because where, where really the rubber hits the road is this in development. And, you know, NEPAD was, uh, had many criti critics within Africa. So there was no consensus. And some of the people that were involved in NEPAD were people like President Wade, not the most nicest person, according to critics. So in other words, Tabon uh, deal was imperiled by this and lack of cohesion. And that there was a change in South Africa. Hu Jintao comes to South Africa and gives a speech at the University of Pretoria. It was a rebuttal to Mbeki's speech. And in the speech, put it clearly, China will never be another colonizer. China was once colonized, et cetera, et cetera. But what we see there also is that after Mbeki, Zuma, South Africa stops attending the G8 completely and starts, because it used to attend the G8 as kind of like an invited guest for, for a long time throughout Mbeki's presidency. But South Africa stopped. I identify this period as South Africa beginning to look east. The failure of NAPAD, the failure of African peer review, South Africa felt like it needed to face the reality or that the hope for economic growth is not going to come from the North, it's going to come from the East and South Africa faces East. It starts attending BRICS, it becomes a member. But BRICS as uh, the late scholar Ian Taylor, a very good man from Scotland, was very encouraging to many people. I remember him with fondness. Whenever he'd meet young scholars, he'd really encourage you. Sometimes scholars don't have time for you when you're a young scholar, but he did. And so I, I pay a tribute to him. Uh, he told me that when we last spoke that um, they, have very, they have nothing in common, these countries uh, in BRICS. And they're also sometimes they're strong rivalries, China, India, and Brazil has its own problems. So these relationships then, these countries' relations with China and these countries' relations with the global world themselves and themselves fencing themselves as powers, has actually been a, a, a been a stumbling block to further progress in the BRICS in the last two years, right? So there's been a lot, a lot that could have been done by BRICS to some of us who expected it, given the pronouncements of 10 years ago, that hasn't really taken place, you know? So then I'm not, without predicting the future, I've just told you what took place. In Brazil, President Temer comes and he replaces Dilma Rousseff, and BRICS right there kind of stopped functioning in full speed. India, Modi takes over, BRICS again. And remember, there's veto power, all countries big and small in BRICS. So we are looking at BRICS in actually in third gear as far as when a car is going uphill and you put it in third gear, it really slows down. Gear is in third gear, but in a non-flattering way right now. Uh, sorry, BRICS. BRICS is in third gear in a non-flattering way. And I'll, tell, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. We actually do have a question from the audience from Dr. Chum. If you can please unmute your mic. Oh, Dr. Chum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, Pior. What a surprise. Well, no, I mean, this is a no miss uh, session here. Congratulations on a very important uh, piece of work. We're very, very proud of you, Pior. Um, just wanted to know in general <clears throat> whether there are sort of uh, structures or mechanisms within China um, to engage with important uh, 
African perspectives on Africa-China relationships, such as your work there. Um, I don't know what the uh, uh, situation in China is in terms of uh, studies on Africa, but I do, I, I mean, I assume that with the kind of interest that they have in Africa and the investments that they have in Africa, that there would be a parallel sort of um, uh, uh, effort or interest to really inform themselves, you know, about uh, different aspects of Africa beyond just the economic, you know, material aspects there. So if, if, if you can sort of just uh, provide some thoughts on, on, on this. Thanks, uh, Professor Cham. Um, I think uh, everyone, uh, I see Professor Cham, and I think I see also our chair at the Department of African Studies, Professor Kamara. Both these people, uh, one is current chair, so you can see Professor Kamara say hi, and Professor Cham, uh, our former chair. So these are uh, our faculty, and Professor Johnson, these are our faculty in the department who have helped us out, and some of this work is kind of, uh, it speaks to the, t it's testament to some of this support that we have at the Department of African Studies. The, you know, very good department for any of us here, if you are participating to be a student in, uh, under Professor Kamara, Professor Cham, Professor Clark, Professor Plama, uh, and Professor Johnson. So thank you for this question, uh, Malumu Cham. Uh, well, there are two. One in BRICS, the BRICS Think Tank Forum, and I've just put here for, uh, for CAC. FOCAC um, uh, started, we first saw it in 2006, but um, it's the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. So in other words, it's this big China-centric multilateral body where whenever it holds a, congress, a, a conference, they call it a meeting, all African heads of state show up enthusiastically. And they usually, you know, there's a rash of deals that are signed uh, and so on and so forth. So that's FOCAC. Well, the Chinese have been at pains to answer Professor Cham's question um, since 2006 to show two things. One, that FOCAC is not a Chinese contraption, right? Indeed, when I was in China, they gave me two books that said, read these books. That FOCAC started thanks to a, Mal a, Mal a Malagasy, um, people from Madagascar, a Malagasy a, a diplomat and a Zimbabwean diplomat who wanted a forum for Africa and China. And so China took this up at the urging and the pleading of these Africans. It's for up to any one of us here to conclude if this you know, holds water or not. So that's the narrative. And in addition to, uh, China has been wanting to kind of debunk this idea then that within these structures, BRICS and FOCAC, China is kind of, when Zulu we say, of Gai Pendulwa, the elephant in the, in the game reserve to whom no one can, can answer, you know, the big elephant here running everything. Eh? So, so China has been at, in, at pains it, to kind of have these structures, uh, Professor Cham, that are parallel, that are within FOCAC, but where Africans participate. One of them is a FOCAC think tank forum. In fact, um, it, but for COVID, some of us would have gone there. It took place in Zhejiang province, and I think they just had it, I think, last month. So it is supposedly then, a, a, a place where exchange of ideas is supposed to take place and Africans are listened to in exchange with the Chinese without, or oh, oh, wait for that word, the attenuation of others you know, in the world. Now, the extent is for people who are here to, re, to kind of find out for themselves, the extent to which some of these um, um, the ideas that are discussed here find traction in each respective country is going to be dis, uh, determined by their respective countries' respect for scholars, right? So a scholar from Malawi may attend this think tank forum, but what if this scholar happens to also just, you know, they, when they come back with findings, they're not listened to by the government and vice versa. Or so, uh, they might just be a scholar who they may say, and the Chinese never ask questions about the veracity of people. So each African country, when it sends people, for a think tank forum of scholars, the Chinese just say, well, we are going to assume it's a scholar. You said it's a scholar, even if it's just a politician or a former politician who happens you know, to have a PhD. So each country is going to have very different outcomes from this forecast because there isn't an overarching 
me mechanism to kind of vet people? Is this really uh, these scholars and not, or it's just part of China's public diplomacy? And I would say it is, it really is, because they focus a lot on its Africans and uh, here. So there are these two, I think I've mentioned these two um, uh, mechanisms, but they're quite, uh, you know, um, um, the jury is out on, on, on how effective they are. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. I mean, this is how we should start every Monday. <laughs> every Monday, <laughs> we need to start. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your intellectual wealth and your inspiration with mm -hmm. us. You gave us ideas about further areas of research, especially for our students. So the book is South Africa-China Relations Between Aspiration and Reality in a Global <laughs> Order by Dr. Piwakule Nyandu. Do you prefer for us to get it on Amazon or through the publisher? What's your preference? <laughs> awesome. Um, you, if you're a student, uh, just wait till spring and you can get it through your textbook voucher. <laughs> but um, if you want to get it right now, um, I prefer you go to uh, um, uh, the publisher because you can get a discount. All right? Great. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so or, much. Oh, here's a big one. Ask your library to get it. Better yet, ask your library to get it. We need to order it <laughs> for our library. <laughs> I want to thank the Department of African Studies and Dr. Msia Kabona Clark for organizing this. Um, we will be in touch with you next semester for future events hosted by the department. Please check out our website, African Studies Department on Howard's website, um, africanstudies.howard.edu. So thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Dr. Mian. Thanks, Ania, and everyone. Giabonga. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Msia. Giabonga, sis. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Giabonga, sis.